Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part two for this news report today. It's Friday, January 25th, 2013. I'm Darko. My website is ggnonline.com and on YouTube my channels are ddarko2012 and ddarko2013 is my backup channel and I've been uploading there just recently. So you can check out the uh, headlines and links and stuff like that. They'll be in YouTube's video description. And I'm ready to go here. We have former Special Forces Commander says was U.S. running guns to Syrian rebels via Benghazi? The CIA says no. So a retired Army general, who is the former commander of the U.S. Special Forces, goes on and says here, in the 90s he worked with the CIA. He told CNS News in a video interview last week that he believes it is a reasonable supposition that the U.S. was supporting or planning to support the Syrian rebels via Benghazi, Libya. So this is actually what I've been saying, right, for the past few months, which is a lot of these weapons after they took down Gaddafi and got the regime changed change there and armed all these uh, Islamist extremists uh, with, quote, links to al-Qaeda, um, that they were actually going into Syria. The CIA, however, says Boykin's uh, supposition is erroneous and that the U.S. was not conducting or planning covert action to support Syrian rebels through Benghazi. Remember, it's uh, smuggling. It's a mug smuggling state is what it is. And these assertions are both baseless and flat wrong, says CIA spokesman on Tuesday. And I agree with him right here. It says, uh, who retired from the Army in 2007, believes that such an action or planned action would help explain why Ambassador Chris Stevens was in Benghazi on September 11, 2012, visiting that city for the first time since he had departed from it in November 2011, after serving there as a special envoy to Libyan rebels who overthrew Gaddafi. He says, then what was Stevens doing there on September 11th of 2012? It says more supposition was that he was now funneling guns to the rebel forces in Syria, using essentially the Turks to facilitate that. Before a terrorist attack, the State Department's uh, special mission compound, which had you know CIA operatives, I think they even had some Marines. On September 11th, Ambassador Stevens had met there with a the Turkish diplomat. And lastly, he says, uh, what possibly was the State Department doing in Benghazi at that point with this sort of skeletal group? And you go in there and check it out. He goes through all the history leading up to that, to where they weren't really needed there. But it says that, so I think that they kept the facilities open. To, uh, they kept them functioning. They had somebody there, uh, had to be there because of the communications equipment, because of the potentially classified material that was still there. And I think they stayed there in anticipation of supporting the Syrian rebels. An exclusive CIA operators were denied requests for help during Benghazi attacks, say sources. They learned from sources on the ground that an urgent request from the CIA annex for military backup uh, says several hours later on the annex itself was denied by the CIA chain of command, who uh, says here also told the CIA operators twice to stand down rather than help the ambassador's team. Hillary Clinton takes blame for Benghazi attack. I haven't covered a lot of this because, you know, who really knows all the truth of it and there's so much spin and stuff. But it uh, goes on here, she defended herself on Wednesday of her foreign policy panels in Washington, D.C. over the handling of the attack in Libya that killed four Americans, uh, four Americans including the U.S. ambassador. says, I take responsibility. Went on to say the Arab revolutions have scrambled power dynamics and shattered security forces across the region. In other words, all of their doing, right? All of their funding of the terrorists and trying to bring down um, um, governments and stuff like that, regime changes. Hillary... Many of you have probably seen this quote, but uh, Hillary on Libya, what difference does it make? So goes after being pressed today by Republicans, basically. Uh, she goes on here and says that, and quote, with all due respect, the fact is we have four dead Americans, whether it was because of protests or because guys outside for a walk one night decided to go kill some Americans, what difference does it at this point does it make so I doubt they were just happen to be going for a walk. Britain, Germany, the Netherlands urge citizens out of Benghazi. Three European countries urged their citizens to leave the rest of eastern Libyan city of Benghazi on Thursday after Libyan officials found a threatening message against Europeans outside a foreign-run company. And this is followed by what U.S. Britain warned of imminent attacks or threats in eastern Libya. They said her in Benghazi. So the British Foreign Office issued a statement early to today uh, It says quickly followed by a similar one from the U.S. State Department cautioning citizens to leave Benghazi, Libya, in response to a specific imminent threat. Clinton testifies, says Algerian terrorists got weapons from Libya. She said that the Islamists who attacked the gas plant in Algeria got their weapons in Libya. 
She also blamed the Northern Africa security vacuum on the Arab Spring, which again, they've all created, right? That's what she was talking about, while testifying in the 20, uh, on September 2012 attack in Benghazi. Ex-Libya rebels deny selling arms to Algeria hostage takers. Libya's former uh, Zentan rebels have denied claims by the Algerian daily that they sold arms to hostage takers at the natural gas installation in eastern Algeria. Quote, we deny the information published by the Algerian newspaper accusing the revolutionaries of having sold weapons used by terrorists, the military council of the Libyan city of Zintan said in a statement issued on Tuesday. Militant reports on Algerian hostage seas were more transparent, accurate than official news. As widely contradictory accounts trickled out about the terror attack in the Algerian gas plant, one source of information proved to be the most reliable announcement by the Al-Qaeda-linked militants themselves. They phoned in regularly with up-to-the-minute reports, offered eerily accurate numbers of hostages taken and killed, and clearly laid out their goals. So it's kind of like all of these other types of uh, revolutions, like they were saying, the Arab, Arab Springs and that. Uh, they have Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts, LiveLeak and YouTube accounts. And very tech-savvy terrorists. So, uh, CIA operative takes responsibility for Algerian plant attack. This is from the 22nd. It was carried by Infowars and Before Us News. So again, don't know how credible this is, but it kind of makes sense uh, when, it, when you put it all together, right? Libya uh, and then Algeria now. It says in the video below, uh, this individual is said to be the mastermind behind the terrorist attack by the Islamist uh, Mullah Thamin Mass Brigade on the Armenis gas complex in Algeria. It takes credit for the operation. He was recruited and trained by CIA in Afghanistan. He was an Afghan Arab uh, recruited from the North Africa uh, area and fought with CIA and Pakistan ISI Mujahideen that would later splinter into Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Following the deadly Afghan civil war that claimed nearly half a million lives, he returned to Algeria in '93 and joined Salafist group for preaching and combat. It goes on here as well, and it says that. Um, that he was part of this Islamic political party poised to take power in Algeria's elections. These members, this GSPC uh, members, were recruited by Algerian intelligence upon returning from the jihad in Afghanistan. Poorly armed Mali army can't stand up to the rebels. It goes on since last week's uh, invasion saw Mali troops fleeing before battle even began. It says, we were surprised to learn that our soldiers ran away, noted one local. Indeed, when explosions ushered in the rebel invasion of the southern town, the junta forces beat a hasty retreat and they only came back after French troops ousted the rebels. The French military's vision of African troops doing most of the heavy lifting in the war will mean a scramble to get the junta geared up for the challenge, but with the summary executions and torture seemingly a way of life for the military's leadership, making them even more powerful seems like it will cause more problems than it solves. You have UN Secretary General saying dialogue not possible at this time with Mali's Islamic insurgents. The UN chief also praised France's military invasion, I mean intervention in Mali, saying, I applaud France for its courageous decision to deploy troops following the troubling move southward by extremist groups. Militant group in Mali ready to negotiate. Let's see here, new Mali rebel faction calls for negotiations, says fighters who say they Split from Al-Qaeda linked Ansar al dine seeks talks to end the French-led offensive in the north. So the group of Malian fighters say they want talks to end the French-led offensive in the north. After splitting from the main force, this isn't the first time I recovered last year, November 6, 2012, Milton Group in Mali ready to negotiate. This is from 12-6. It says uh, Ansar al-Dine warns against their exclusion from Mali peace talks. And then we have, again, from uh, 2 11 2012, Mali extremists head to Burkina, Algeria for talks. Al Qaeda's leader, leader's brother condemns Mali operation. Says the brother of Al Qaeda leader, uh, Mr. Zahari, on Wednesday sanctioned violence against the West in retaliation for the French led campaign against militants in Mali, saying the U.S. and Europe are making jihadists. So, pretty interesting little comment there. This barbarism, aggression, and brutality, according to Sharia law, we have to confront it, he says. Next up, militants in Mali preparing for war against Al Qaeda. The National Movement for Liberation of this Azawad, MNLA, in northern Mali is preparing to wage war against Al-Qaeda and the gangs loyal to it. The 
These elements have asked the Azwada tribes to ally with them and declare war on Al-Qaeda. They believe that Al-Qaeda is preventing their victory over the Malian army and impending liberation of northern Mali from the government, whose control they see as colonial legacy. And there's a nice propaganda piece to fight African terrorism. Start by educating girls. So got to educate the women. It says military-only strategy is doomed to fail. The U.S. entire world ought to be very worried about what's going on in Mali and Algeria and the rest of the Sahel region in Africa because things are going to get much worse without radical new policies, writes a whatever, Malcolm Potts and the LA Times, but such changes start with not so radical ideas of educating girls, making sure women have access to birth control. Mm, that's the priority. Islamic fundamentalists are taking advantage of exploding populations, including countless young men with no prospect of work, and cultures that think it's okay to marry off girls as young as 10. It says small experiments in villages have shown that this is possible to keep girls in school. He remember yesterday's video, keep them in school. It will take 20 years and billions of dollars to bring projects such as this to scale. Remember, you remember you had the former KGB, uh, Mr. Bresmanoff, saying it takes about 20 years to brainwash. Um, when you want to uh, basically take over a country, you got to take over their culture and create uh, subversion, political, social subversion. And it takes about 20 years to shape the minds of the youth to get them to where you want uh, to rebel against their own system. So you go in there and replace it for them. But there is no other plausible way to bring stability to the region. Yes, we need boots on the ground, but the war on terror will continue uh, to fail unless we convert a few days military expenditure into investing into girls' education and family planning. 93% of readers thought that that article was brilliant. Rights group accuses Mali troops of more summary executions. Dozens reportedly executed for lacking ID cards. So yet another human rights group is calling the Malian junta to account for tonight for its troops being involved in these executions of detainees says here they're claiming credible evidence for dozens of executions in all towns all along the frontier with the rebel held north often victims were people who arrived without a state issued id card and were members of ethnic groups of the junta identities or identifies as supporting the rebels leading to their detention as infiltrators and quick execution without trial in infrastructureless northern mali villages many people never got such ids in the first place they also report that ethnic Tureg rebel or fighters, Tureg people living in the capital, had their homes attacked by the Huta in recent days. Mali Ar army spokesman uh, says here that these executions were shrugged off with uh, the justice minister and, uh, insisting that, quote, no army in the world is perfect, end quote. Mali's north faces a new fear. It says, as Al-Qaeda link rebels withdraw, reprisal attacks and human rights abuses are reported in the north goes on and says many of Mali's northerners have been liberated of the armed groups that invaded their communities and imposed upon them a harsh form of Islamic law. It says here, however, there's evidence of reprisal killings and raids targeting Tuaregs and Arabs based on their ethnicity. Whole communities now have something new to fear, collective pun punishment. These two Tureg men were executed in the central town of Niono. It says also at least three victims were killed inside a military base. Others were killed in a hospital and at a bus stop. French war on Mali increases refugees, which is what they want, right? To create instability and mix everybody up, get the tribes in fighting so they can dominate them, take them over. The number of Malian people crossing into neighboring countries goes on the rise amid French-led war on Mali. So according to the reports, there's over 4,000 Malian refugees that arrived in this uh, Mauritania alone in January 11th. Timbuktu is a ghost town as Islamists leave. They've left the fabled Timbuktu in northern Mali turning it into a ghost town with no electricity or drinking water for three days, residents say. It's like Syrian refugees, right? They had it before, now they don't. Residents said for three days they had been no power or drinkable water. It says here the Islamists kept electricity and water running with generators, but their departure left a vacuum, especially as their fuel stocks have been destroyed in French air raids. Pretty interesting little connection. We're talking about ghost town. I have fury over French soldier pictured wearing Call of Duty style grinning skeletons or skeleton death's head face mask while serving in Mali. It's worn by Call of Duty character Ghost. The French trooper was wearing one to protect himself from helicopter dust. The military chief says it was unacceptable behavior. Prince Harry claimed video games made him useful as a helicopter gunner. So here's the uh, actual picture there. It is kind of eerie looking. Um, 
There's another picture of it. And back to the future in Mali as French neocolonialism looms over Africa. They view Mali as a promising source of uranium and oil as part of a geopolitical game. This is GGN. Thank you.